How she got banned off MySpace is because she posted a naked picture of herself because her ex-boyfriend posted it. So she was like, oh, I'm going to put it on MySpace because I don't care. Who does that? Okay. I don't want to read any of your stupid <laughs> private messages, okay? Seriously, guys. 20-year-old John Hawk has his own web show. He streams live videos and has quite a few followers. But this is Hawk's mugshot. Police say he <laughs> the woman live online. Why are you smoking in the Memorial Hill tonight? Can do whatever I want. If I had a 15 year old child and like a 20 something year old impregnated her, woo! This is Amor Hilton. This is my beautiful girlfriend. <laughs> you know how many of those are probably underage? 98% of them. You, you But he called it the punishment chair. And in the punishment chair, the straight boys would have to sit. Yeah. I'll let your imagination go wild. <laughs> it was bad. Wait. Hey celebrities, it's Vitaly and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Thanks for all the support in the two previous videos in the MySpace segment, I really appreciate you guys. In those videos I talked about what was it like to be first ever a MySpace celebrity, but today's topic is way more serious. As we all know, with great power comes great responsibility, and fame has a dark side. Today we're gonna talk about a lot of crazy stuff. When I started researching for this video, I couldn't even imagine what I was getting myself into. Cyberstalking, cyberbullying, blackmailing, D-threats, these are the terms that are no stranger to some of the early web's popular names. And I even got a chance to interview one of the most notorious scene queens, and now one of my friends, about her traumatizing experience growing up in the MySpace limelight, the one and only Amor Hilton. Is that my baby daddy? <laughs> it better be. <laughs> I was getting really jealous because you're talking about everyone except me. <laughs> After all these years, she finally got a chance to speak her truth. So buckle up, legend, that I know I said all the time, but today you're really not ready for this one. Only on Vitaly's channel. But before we get started, thanks to Keraf for making this video possible. Keraf is a subscription service that ships high quality personalized vitamins, supplements and powders straight to your door every month. All you gotta do to get started is to take a short and simple online quiz about your lifestyle and health goals. And Keraf will give you doctor-backed recommendations, it's that easy. The service makes taking your vitamins on a go super convenient, cause the individual daily packs they have are just perfect for a busy routine. Just throw a few in your purse or gym bag and you're all set. I just received my first package recently and it's a lifesaver you guys. My new year's resolution is to focus more on my health and Keraf helps me a lot with it. I have this thing where after a long day I feel extremely drained and experience this weird sense of brain fog, which I hate. It doesn't matter if I'm stressed out or not, after 6 p.m. I cannot function. But thanks to our sponsor, now I have the supplements I need to get me through the day. I have a lot of essential vitamins in my package, but my favorite would probably be this maca powder. That helps me to support my energy level, cause it's adaptogenic properties maintain my stamina and endurance during the day. After a workout, I usually mix one teaspoon of maca with my favorite plant protein, which is also from Kerov, by the way, so yummy. Not only this shake helps me to recover from the intense workout, but I also finally feel energetic enough to function during the night time, which is something new for me, not gonna lie. You should definitely give it a try, and obviously I have a little gift for you, celebrity. Use my code VITALY50 for 50% off your first month subscription with Kerov. Just go to takecareof.com and use my code VITALY50 to get 50% off your first month subscription, or you can visit my link in the description box down below. Definitely Vitaly approved. I want to start with the horrifying case of Kiki Cannibal. Throughout this video, I'm gonna be referring to this Rolling Stone article about her, so shout out to them. And also, I do want to mention that a few days ago, I also reached out to Kiki and not her if she was willing to give some comments for my channel too. She never responded. She doesn't have to, obviously, but there is this weird coincidence that I find interesting. As soon as I reached out, she deleted all of her YouTube videos from a few years ago, where she also addressed some of the stuff that we're gonna talk about today. Strange coincidence, right? But anyway. Born Kirsten Ostranga, Kiki was one of the first ever teen internet celebrities, as she gained prominence as one of the original scene queens on MySpace in 2006, and her story quickly escalated into a ton of crazy things. But let's start from the very beginning. Fame was not Kiki's intention when she first signed up to MySpace in 06. She was just a lonely 13 year old whose days at her middle school had become a bully in hell. Her family had transplanted from the Chicago area to Florida, hoping that it would be an exciting new chapter in their life. But unfortunately, the opposite happened. 
happened. From the day she started 6th grade at her new school, Kiki had a hard time fitting in, so she had no other option but to fight back by embracing her outsider status, chopping her long hair and dyeing it pink. She remade herself into a scene queen, a rising trend at the time. Thick makeup, piercings, fishnets, bright colors and lots of Hello Kitty. But Kiki's new look made her even more of a freak at school, so her parents withdrew her to homeschool after 7th grade. Now she was stuck at home, wondering how she could meet new friends. She wanted to find misfits like herself, so with her parents' permission, she joined MySpace. The rest is history. Calling her profile Kiki Cannibal, she began posting tons of pictures of herself. She'd layered, bleached and fluffed her hair, and then dyed it with dark horizontal stripes. I feel like that was her trademark at this point. It wasn't long until she adopted this outrageous online persona, as the real Kirsten was insecure and anti-social. Her friend count on MySpace quickly blew up. She was so excited by her newfound popularity. Every time she logged in, more and more friend requests were waiting. At first a handful, then dozens, and then 25,000 within 3 months. Fluttered Kiki Kiki accepted everyone. It was kinda like a video game, she says. I didn't see it as real people, more like as a number. But she was yet to discover that all of her new friends were not that friendly after all. Every time she logged in, she found her page spammed with tons of hate messages from teens. To say that Kiki was horrified would be an understatement of the century. A 17-year-old stranger who claimed she lived near Kiki's hometown sent her a message that said, quote-unquote, I will laugh and beat the living sh get out of you. Go ahead and call the cops, see what they do. My father was a cop in the city, and I can't get away with m if I wanted to. If I ever saw Kiki Cannibal in person again, I would f***ing, I probably would punch her. I'm sorry. Another girl posted Kiki's real name, and another her phone number, and that's just a few examples on what kind of threat she's been receiving during that time. Now, keep that in mind. Around that same time in 2007, Kiki found another passion for herself, Stickam.com. A then new website where teen users live streamed themselves while chatting with fans. Hurting my income, girl. Jeffree Star is gonna sign me to his label. Oh, you don't even know! <laughs> I felt like it would be a chance for people to get to know me, Kiki explained. I wanted to show them, hey, the girl you're seeing on MySpace with all this hate is not me. That I have feelings, I wanted to be more relatable. She was sick of feeling like a victim, and that was her chance to turn things around. Her stick on debut was this video that still gets views to this day. People really loved that video, she says. They thought it was really funny, so that was encouragement to do more. Kiki Schmanable. This girl, I was born like this. I was born with this name. I don't eat cake face, baby, but love to see you on the street, girl. At first, hundreds of viewers tuned in, then thousands, then incredibly tens of thousands, and she was still receiving the immense amount of hate. She doesn't care about other people, she's too full of herself. She tries to act cool, but she would never like hang out with those fans or talk to them. She's too big of a star, celebrity, at least that's what she thinks. Like seriously, sometimes if you watch her on sick cam live, like sometimes she's funny, sometimes she's entertaining, but most of the time you're just like losing IQ points by the minute, like seriously, you're just like, what is this girl on? Like that's all I can think about really honestly when I watch her live, I'm just like... Don't forget to like this video celeb don't be shady, also we're so close to 50k subs. So her parents suggested that it was time for Kiki to leave MySpace, but she protested. If you take me off the internet, the bullies will win, she screamed. So they let her stay online, but here's the thing. It turns out she didn't tell them the other reason she didn't want to leave the platform. And that reason was, any guesses, a boy. Well, not exactly a boy, to begin with. His name was Danny Cespedes, or Cespedes. Cespedes. Cespedes, I was right. Online, he was known as Mr. MySpace. He told Kiki he was 17, but he was really 18. He was the definition of the scene boy. They began chatting online, and it wasn't long until he made her feel like someone out there really liked her, and then insisted to meet up. He lived near Miami. They met on Kiki's 14th birthday at a mall on September of 2006, accompanied by her mom. I just want to be friends with your daughter, he claimed and presented Kiki with a crystal Hello Kitty necklace. Her mom was impressed by how polite Danny was, so from that moment she allowed them to go on outings by themselves, which quickly turned into makeout sessions in Danny's car. Well, obviously. Kiki was thrilled to be in a romance with her first boyfriend. Their love story blossomed under the scrutiny of their online audience. The pages of those two were constantly under the microscope. Okay, so I do admit that once in a while we can get a bit stalkerish, right? So I'm looking up Kiki Cannonball and you know, she's probably like, wow, Wow, she's all over the mother 
internet that's how she got banned off myspace is because she posted a naked picture of herself because her boyfriend posted it so she was like oh i'm gonna put it on myspace because i don't care who does that okay seriously first of all yeah i actually found another nude picture of her just like looking for information and i'm like oh my god like that's that's like embarrassing but in real life it was a different story where danny was moving too fast and kiki nervously told him that she didn't want to get intimate yet but that didn't last long one night in November, Danny was at the Strangas when he started acting really strange. He was really off, he was drunk or something, and then passed out. Her parents, unsure what to do, decided to let him slip it off on the couch. And that was a huge mistake. In the middle of the night, Danny crawled into Kiki's bed. Baby, do you love me? He asked, reaching into her underwear. She did love him, but she didn't want to do it. And yet, no matter how many times she told him no, at least 10 times, Danny persisted. She was tired of fighting him off, and she could see that he was not going to take no for an answer. The moment Kiki stopped resisting, he forced himself on her. If your mom found out, we wouldn't be together, he claimed. Kiki was covered in shame. She felt betrayed and deeply violated by what Danny had just done to her. But at the same time, she didn't want to lose him. So she kept quiet and continued dating him, including being intimate. It was always like, if you don't do this, you don't love me. I kind of pretended like it never happened, she recalls. Danny's family didn't like his hanging out with Kiki. He would often return home wearing eyeliner, nail polish and hair highlights applied by Kiki. Absolutely upsetting his mother. One day, she even called mama cannibal and screamed, he looks like a nothing F-word. She even insisted that the two stop seeing each other. Tired of the drama, Kiki was beginning to agree with her parents. It was time to break up with Danny. She met him in her driveway and gave him back his Power Rangers that he once presented to her. Danny, crying hysterically, responded by pulling out a handful of pills and swallowed all of them. Danny, don't do that, Kiki screamed, but he roughly pushed her away and sped off in his car. Sobbing, Kiki ran inside to call the police. Danny survived the unalive in himself attempt. He was hospitalized nearby, but Kiki was too scared to break up with him again, so she continued seeing him behind her parents' back. I felt so responsible. If he passed, I didn't want that on my shoulders. But at the same time, she was being flattered at being wanted that much. But a month after Danny told Kiki that they would be together forever, he moved to North Carolina. Soon after, she received a message on MySpace alerting her that Danny, at the time a few weeks away from his 19th birthday, was dating another 14-year-old. Kiki was crushed, but the worst was yet to come. own brand from Mr. MySpace. He usually reached out to them through MySpace just as he'd found Kiki. As a result, she stopped eating and taking care of herself. She even dwindled down to 72 pounds. Obviously, her parents sensed that something was seriously wrong with their daughter, so she told them everything that was going on. The Strangas immediately called the police and investigation began. While Kirsten Strangas' life was falling apart, Kiki Cannibal continued posted as though nothing had happened. But the nightmare was far from being over. The Stranga house was then vandalized that same year in 2007. Her parents' home was splattered with ketchup, chocolate syrup and eggs. Maybe this is just a dream, she thought. But she gasped as soon as she reached the driveway. And across the garage door, big as a billboard, the word s was painted. Oh my god, Kiki whispered. That was way more than she could handle. Yup, for the past year she's been through a lot online. But the vandalism of her home was a different level of harassment. Two weeks after the vandalism, Kiki's mom was folding laundry. When she thought about Danny's parents, how would they react once Danny was arrested for Kiki's and how far would Danny or her stalkers go to hurt the family? The Strangas had no other choice but to move out, leaving their house in an empty shell. I asked the detective, how are we going to end up being unalived, her mom recalls. And he told me, I'm going to be blunt with you. If somebody wants to unalive you, and they're probably going to succeed. Kiki unplugged from the internet for three weeks, while their family settled in at her grandmother's place near Orlando. She finally was in peace. When she logged back on, she really hoped that all the online craziness had died down. But that was not the case. We'll get back to it a little bit later. October 19th to 2007. Police finally arrested Danny on seven felony counts of stature. They found him at the mall surrounded by a bunch of young girls with a lot of 
was found on him. He didn't resist as police cuffed him. They walked him on the second floor of the parking garage. And then something crazy happened. A gust of wind blew some paperwork out of Cuff's hand. In that moment of confusion, Danny tried to run away from the police by jumping off a two-story parking garage. Apparently, he wanted to land in a garbage dumpster, but instead smacked against the pavement. As a result of his severe injuries, he got in a coma for three months until he passed in December of 2007. Around the same time, a stranger appeared in Kiki's Stickham chat room and posted a link, stickydrama.com, trying to get her attention, which leads us to the whole new crazy rabbit hole. When she clicked it, she found a website dedicated to not just gossiping, but bullying Stickham users, especially her. It was much like the trashing she'd been already getting all along, except this website was far more professional looking than anything else she had ever encountered. Sticky drama, no! No, no, no! YouTube. And the founder of the website was not a teenager, but a grown man looking to make that coin on team drama, Christopher Stone. Chris Stone has a site called Sticky Drama. For the record, this name is gonna appear a lot throughout this video, so you better get ready. He also launched Sticky Nudes, which happened to be an archive of naked photos of the MySpace influencers. He co-founded the website after watching Stickham's growing popularity and realizing that making fun of those teens was a potential goldmine. Sticky Drama quickly became the go-to website for gossip on wannabe web celebrities. In 2009, David posted screenshots of a 20 year old doing things to an unconscious girl. But we'll get back to this one, trust me. Focusing on top influencers like Kiki Cannibal was a proven way to gain traffic on the website. But one day, it all went too far. In May of 2008, Sticky Drama posted a photo of Danny, Mr. MySpace, laying in his coffin. Yes, you heard me right. Obviously, I'm not gonna show it in the video. Alongside an article titled MySpace Murder Mystery, it detailed Danny's fall, adding, quote unquote, rumor has it that Cannibal had copyrighted or plotted with the police out of revenge for Danny dumping her. As a result, Sticky Drama declared Kiki responsible for his passing. That's crazy. And the backlash she received was out of control. The theory that she had Danny spread throughout the entire web. The craziness started all over again. Someone in my neighborhood would write me, saying, I see you walking your dog, and describe my dog. I was so on edge, anxious, and paranoid. The parents obviously tried taking action. The LAPD took a report on the founder, but determined the case did not meet its criminal filing criteria. I don't understand what his obsession is, but he had the sick and twisted love-hate relationship with me. I wanna summarize Kiki's story somehow, but honestly, I truly have no comments. Seriously. This is insane, what she had to go through its such a young age. Nowadays, she's active on Instagram, where she has 30,000 followers and seemingly enjoying a low-key happy lifestyle. And by the way, this girl does not age. She still looks 17. How come? The jeans I'm setting up for, not gonna lie. Now, the time has come to talk about another horrifying case, the case of John Hawk. He made a name for himself on MySpace by posting pictures and videos of himself. He was the ultimate scene heartthrob. He also had a popular show on Stickham. During live streams, he would give away a bunch of free stuff, as well as do signs for his fans. He was even proclaimed the king of Stickham. Got a couple more signs up for you guys. Give me just a moment. Great to see you all in here, though. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I don't want to read any of your stupid private messages, okay? Seriously, guys, okay. I've been going through so much shit, no one understands. I'm just gonna be honest with you, you can put this wherever the f you want, okay? There is seemingly nothing crazy, right? Just the popular scene boy doing his thing while sitting on the MySpace throne. So 2000s, we might think. But that was until February 26, 2009. The fateful day that would change his life forever. Taken off the website now, but not before police say it ran over and over. A 30 minute when police say the victim has no memory of. I did cut my hair off. 20 year old John Hawk has his own web show. He streams live videos and has quite a few followers. But this is Hawk's mugshot. Police say he the woman live online. Investigators say Hawk set up a webcam in his girlfriend of two weeks' bedroom as she slept inside her North Phoenix home. Police say she had been drinking and passed out. This young lady had received uh, several calls and contacts from her friends who told her, you know, basically, hey, you know what, we saw you on this website and, um, and uh, it, you know, it looked like you were having with this guy. Uh, she had no recollection of this. The 20-year-old says she was unconscious. This a picture of the alleged 
still up on the website. The victim nude as people watched and wrote things like, poor girl and she's out cold. Some called police saying Hawk was bragging on the video that he could have with her without her even knowing. Apparently Hawk didn't know the victim would be going to police. Besides the fact that she is uh, obviously mentally uh, traumatized by this, uh, she, she, she's doing as well as could be expected. I had a talk to police last night. Police say Hawk turned himself in. I don't even know how to comment on that, honestly, that's freaking crazy. As the aftermath, he was banned from numerous websites, except for MySpace. But that was for the better, because soon a small team of individuals obtained access to his page, and they successfully customized his profile. Check it out. Now, before all that craziness happened, he dated the MySpace princess Amor Hilton. Oh my god. Do you know what's going on right now, guys? Do you even know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> say hi to the camera, guys. Everyone say, what's up, stick him? This is Amor Hilton. This is my beautiful girlfriend. Hi! Okay, I'm gonna turn my hair into a girl. Okay, ready? Voila. I'm not gonna talk a lot about their relationship because she's gonna spill all the tea herself. Like, if it was 2024, people would be tripping over the fact a 14 year old girl is with a almost 20 year old. People would be losing their shit. But. Back then, it was like, it was normal. If you're a John Hawk fan, you can go f*** yourself. John Hawk, Amore Hilton. She's probably 18, but she looks 14. He loves younger girls. You know how many of those f***s are probably underage? 98% of them. You! In September of 2010, he's been sentenced to two and a half years in prison. He pleaded guilty of two counts of attempted SA, as well as sentenced to lifetime probation. And this is John Hawk now. Well, at least in 2015, he looked like that. Okay, all of this craziness leads us to no less disturbing case of Amor Hilton. She initially started with Life Journal, where she posted a bunch of poetry and melancholic lyrics. You know, stuff that every scene kid would do in the early 2000s. And then it was MySpace, obviously. She began getting popularity just like that, with her cotton candy, pink hair, blue eyes, silver nose ring, and remarkable tattoos. Hey, what's up? I'm Amor Nicole from Ruka Girls. Hi, I'm Amor Nicole, and I'm from Ruka Girls. No. Skim is good for you. This is what you should be drinking. White milk. Skim milk. Hi, I'm Amor Hilton, and... I don't know. <laughs> when I say she was one of the most recognizable faces in the scene, I truly mean it. If you go to any video compilation of scene queens on YouTube, you'll definitely stumble across Miss Amor Hilton. She was in Hot Topic commercials, she was in magazines. Her circle of friends were the most influential people in the scene days. And let me tell you something, she was even in an episode of Hannah Montana. But that's not the only flag she has. Does the MTV show Catfish sound familiar to you? Yep, you already know. Every Wednesday night, she hosted a live show on Stickam, which we're now familiar with. And that platform was a great way to increase her fan base even more. But with fans, she was also attracting a lot of creeps. One time, she even found broken doll parts spread out on top of her car. It weirded me out, she said, but I was not bothered by it. The queen is unbothered. <laughs> but one day, she received a weird phone call. If you hang up, I'll shut off your phone, the stranger said. Pfft, whatever, she thought, and hung up. But that didn't stop there. The stranger went as far as really disconnected herself cell phone and took over her Stigam account. Then he demanded phone and nudes from Hilton. It turned out that the hacker was a guy by the name Jeffrey Weinberg, also known as VIP, who was convinced for hacking none other than Paris Hilton's sidekick a few years prior. Speaking of iconic victims, what is wrong with all these people, like seriously? I was actually here at the ranch and I went in the room and I logged in and I was trying, 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 but it was connected to my old cell phone number. So somehow some way i got myself into back into my stick M account it was relatively new like at that time and when i went in there this i'm gonna bleed myself dum dum <laughs> <laughs> put his zip code so then i combined his zip code with his ip address and boom i found him and the detective was here excuse my language the freaking detective was here and he's going what the hell like this little girl just like duped all of us and at this time there was no cyber bullying laws there was no internet stalking like this is a whole new world i guess detective walking out and he turns around to john and he goes you know what you're doing is illegal right turns at me stares at me and john went the f 
does he mean by that? And I'm like, not sure. Like, I didn't know how to, like, perceive that. You know, I was just like, I don't know. As a result, Weinberg was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to two years in prison. But these are not the only crazy things that ever happened to Amor. But she's gonna tell you about all of them herself. Is that my baby daddy? <laughs> it better be. <laughs> He was getting really jealous because you're talking about everyone next to me. <laughs> That's how I fall asleep at night as I listen to your voice. And literally, it's just so soothing that I go, it knocks me out. I'm just like, if I can't sleep like really bad insomnia, I just listen to you and I'm like. You know, I was almost 15 years old. Chris Stone and John Hawk both wanted me to like, make myself look like I was older. So if you Google it, it says I was born in like the 80s. It's not true. And by the way, I was not born in Israel. I was born in 1991. Yeah, anybody knew about that, quite frankly, like at the time. I don't think that anybody actually like <laughs> knew this was like a little bite of celebrity. I don't think anyone actually knew that. Like we were kind of just rolling with it. And it kind of like, strikes me right. weird because at the same time i'm like if this was back in the day we would have so many endorsements back then we were broke as f like everything i'm wearing is under the budget of 20 dollars starbucks when i is exactly when i turned 18 um this guy that i was like kind of dating he was an older gentleman like we started kind of seeing each other and it was really cool like for a little bit of time until it wasn't and he had already like recorded some adult interaction and at that point i was kind of on this line of being blackmailed and if you dive deep enough you can find like voicemails for that because i was just upset like i was screaming crying like and I was like, I don't know what the f to do. Da, da, da. I would, and I even offered to pay the, this individual off to keep it offline. But even though I paid him, it still went online. And then after that, you kind of are in this ground of, do I just uh, like move on with my life? I guess when people perceive you as like you're already an adult entertainer you're kind of just like stuck there. And so I was like in this fork in the road going, okay, well, like, am I going to pursue this path? Or am I just gonna be like the shameful minded idiot that used to happen? So instead I pursued that, yeah. And it was awesome. Like those are the only true real friends that I have are those people that work in the adult industry because they're only people who don't judge me. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Make sure you don't I'm, try, I'm trying to like yeah. get this all through my head of exactly what's going on. He actually messaged me the other day. We were engaged and I was pregnant. <laughs> I was way too young. I was under 18. Like it doesn't even make any common sense that anybody back then would think that this is okay, you know, because as of being um, 32 years old now, like I just turned 32, I'm going, this is really creepy. If I had a 15 year old child and like a 20 something year old impregnated her and then groomed her, woo! Back in the MySpace era, no one cared. That's my point. Like no one cared. And I thought I was lying about my age to John. And I said I was 16 instead of 15. Does that even make a difference? But it turns out that he even paid a substantial amount of money to his ex, so she goes public to defend him amid the lawsuit. Yeah, and I was paid off to make that YouTube video. People are always asking me, so you think that it's okay what he did to that girl and blah blah blah, and no, not, I don't necessarily think that it's okay what he did to that girl. But it was his girlfriend at the time, and as his ex-fiance, I know that he's done, you know, other things <laughs> that are you know, very John-like. That was very John-like, for instance. And people who don't know him in person and don't know who the true person he is, like I do, seem to, you know, just let that fly over their head, you know? He knows he f 
but he didn't know that you know his girlfriend was going to get so offended by that you know i wanted to make a, like a retaliation video going you know like back then I was really young. Right. I got paid off for this. Like, it doesn't make any sense anymore. Like, it's like the same thing as a NDA. Eventually, they expire. So now I'm allowed to like tell my side of the story, and I'm like, okay. I was trying to have like self verification. Like, oh, it was okay that like you were with him. You know. What did he text you? That, that he texted. He you? wants to go smoke weed with me and my brother Adam and hang out. He's like, oh, we can be in like old times, old times, like as in like when I was like 15 years old, <laughs> and you got me pregnant. Like, uh, not really like old times, baby. Like not in a positive way, at least. And I said because you are the father of my deceased son. I will be friends with you, like on a platonic, you know, just because we have that connection and I miss my son. Like, I think you just have to be a mom to like understand like that connection. But nothing has devastated me more than that. And I tried to look up my old MySpace blogs because I wrote this really like in-depth, heartfelt thing every single day about my son. And any given reason that I could possibly think I would do it and be like, well, he's the father of Cody and da 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 Yeah. As a 32-year-old full-grown woman, I'm going, Right. That was nonsense. Yeah. And I would totally kill someone if they ever touched my 15-year-old. Yeah. This is where Chris Stone, the founder of Sticky Drama, comes into the picture. Adam Moore's experience with him was nothing but terrifying. I also want to mention a so-called Sticky House that Stone created in 2009. His love for reality TV and web drama had inspired him to make an online reality show. He invited popular teams to live in this fancy apartment in downtown LA so he could film and broadcast the resulting drama. I think that's a yes. Well, here we go. Hi, Adam Moore, of course. Then this is, I guess, my first uh, video for the sticky house, I suppose. So I just turned around, there was this pink haired p next to me, and I guess, like, I'm gonna end up stay at my place for a while. I don't know. What about the pink haired p? What's your opinion on her? Hey, you know, I love her, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was one of the first ever IRL live shows, before it even was a thing. The streams were posted on Sticky Drama whenever they were finished, but nowadays most of the footage have been lost, because Sticky was shut down around 2013. He's a gay man, and he's... Right at that point, he was like in his 30s. Now he's probably like in his 40s. His name is Christopher Stone. AKA Sticky Drama. Chris, I don't even know how to begin this because it's just so f***ed up. Like, there's no way, like, you know, I have a good sense of humor, but I'm like, there's like no way for me to actually like say anything without you being f***ed up too. That's where I lived and basically he would tell me that I had to starve unless I did whatever content he wanted me to do, which is, you know, like dancing. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like whatever the hell us kids were up to back then. Yeah, I wasn't allowed to eat, have access to medical prescription drugs, like Keppra, which is an anti-seizure medication. He would hold like the medicine hostage, basically, and he wouldn't let me take it. And he would be like, well, you're going to seize to like, I'm not joking, but those are his words. That's when he started beating me up and doing this and that and the other thing. And this is when shit just gets crazier. I'm like, there is such a deep dive into MySpace and stick out that you don't even fucking realize existed. And, and he's the one who made the fake paperwork. And made me sign it because I don't even know if I should say that, but it landed me into like a situation um, where I was Lindsay Lohan, <laughs> like I got 5150 because I passed out in a bathtub. And then after that, like I was freaking out so hard. And he said, if you sign these paperwork, like these documents saying that 
I can be your power of attorney, which is basically saying I'm being Britney'd and I'm under conservatorship. And when I just refound these documents, at the very, very, very bottom of it, it wasn't meant to be an actual document. He had me under the impression that it was. And so whatever he said, I submitted to. Whatever he said I would do because he would constantly keep threatening me to put me away. There's a video, my personal Facebook, and it's on private right now, but if you go onto it, I'm like literally looking this way the whole time. I'm like, I apologize for whatever I posted. You did not beat the hell out of me. No way. This is Amor. Today is Friday, May 17th, 2013. I'm posting this video to retract some false statements that I published a few days ago. My manager, Christopher Stone, did not beat or abuse me. He yelled at me for ruining his furniture and I deserve to be yelled at. He also pays my living expenses and my talent management agreement with him does not allow me to just fire him. Thank you. He was doing unbelievable things to young, straight, I call them straight, like straight with an eight, because they're, you know, curious. Like, they're not straight, but they're straight, you know? Really making boys' lives hell. He had a thing called uh, the punishment chair, and it's like my little swivel chair I'm on right now, but it was from Ikea. And it had a toilet seat. So basically, you can probably find it at the hospital. But he called it the punishment chair. And in the punishment chair, the straight boys would have to sit. Yeah. I'll let your imagination go wild. It was bad. It was insane. And it was until he beat me up that I was like, okay, let's... We had just come back from... I think it was like Macy's or one of those stores and we got a brand new mattress. I had a seizure. I have epilepsy and I woke up in the hospital and I got home and I had this little tiny like weed bong. Easy little baby one. And I was still in walking because I just got to the hospital and I fell asleep with the little baby bong in my hands. And I woke up to Chris grabbing me by the hair like this and then throwing me against the wall and he just started hitting me like in the face over and over and over again. And I just ran. I like, I just ran. I ran down the staircase and I got to this really nice, big, you know, African dude, the security guy. And I hid underneath and I was just shaking and just crying and screaming because I didn't know what to do. And every time I heard like the elevator open, I was just like, oh great. Like this is when Chris walks out and he f***s me up. Like how do we allow this to happen? As we can tell, the sticky house crew couldn't care less about her declining physical and mental health. Their main focus was on exploiting her for profit. As I said, Stigam had shut down in 2013 due to its irrelevancy, and the main audience of the website was getting more and more disinterested in the community. As a result, sticky drama and by extension the reality show disappeared into the abyss of the scene culture. Honestly, celebrities, today's video was kinda a lot for me. We can all agree that MySpace is a great nostalgic thing to look back on. It marked the beginning of social media as we know it today. However, there is no denying that MySpace had ruined a lot of people's lives, especially for teenagers. Celebrity, let me know your opinion in the comments section down below. Were you around when all of that was happening? How different life would be if those websites had never been created? Once again, I wanna say a huge thank you to Amor for being brave enough to share her story with all of us. This video would not be the same without her, hands down. Legend, if you're into to this type of content, please like the video. I pretty much haven't slept for a few nights to research all of this, but I'm so happy I did. Follow me on Instagram at Vitali for the record, and I will see you in my next video this week. And remember, your ex is definitely toxic. The best way to make him better is to become successful. By legends.